This video is sponsored by Jerry's Artorama. Jerry's Artorama Online has been serving artists for over 50 years, providing only the best quality art supplies. Jerry's Artorama has premier lines that sell all over the world and are used by millions of artists and professionals worldwide for amazing results. In addition to over 65,000 fine art supplies, choose from over 4,000 free art lessons, oil painting, drawing, acrylics, watercolors, mixed media, and the largest selection of new supplies professionally evaluated and created by artists for artists. Jerry's Artorama has been empowering artists since 1968. We provide reliability, better art supplies, great prices, and exceptional service. The quality of your art matters to us. Hello, everybody. Today, we are doing part three of our painting curriculum for self-taught artists. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at ArtProf, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Now, we have a whole section on artprof.org on the many curriculums, and we also have accompanying Google Docs, which give you more resources. And so far, we have done two parts. Part one, we described different types of paint. Part two, we gave you painting prompts. And today, we're going to go over painting tools, starting out with DA brushes. <laughs> right, Alex? I mean, you have to. <laughs> There are two things that people ask me a lot about. And the first one is, does the price of my brush matter? Because there are some brushes that they're practically giving to you. There's others that are like $100 each. Does it matter to you, Alex? Honestly, I think the best comparison to make is thinking of like uh, like bottles of wine, where the, you, the difference between a $4 bottle and a $10 bottle is very apparent. But the difference between a $10 bottle and a $50 bottle is it you can hardly tell. And I think with brushes, it's a lot like that. I would just say firmly, don't buy the cheapest brushes, period, because they are just not an accurate representation of what painting with them is like. You don't need to decide, I'm going to be a painter and then buy the most expensive brushes out there. Honestly, that great, like professional grade, middle of the road, it's worth that extra money rather than wasting your money on a on crummy materials. The only crappy thing about cheap brushes that I will not put up with is if I'm painting with them and the bristles come out onto the painting. That mm -hmm. I don't like. But beyond that, I don't care. And it's funny because I am somebody who's picky about price and brand and stuff like that, but not with brushes. I sort of don't care. Yeah, I think there's, whoop, I have them here and I they're still in the package because I'm still afraid to open them. These are the Windsor Newton Sable brushes, which are just amazing. And I'm just very intimidated by using it. And these are the nicest brushes I've personally ever owned and I've been painting my entire life. So yeah, it's not like there is no Harry Potter action of you pick up a brush and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it, it works that way. There are some brushes I've had for years, some brushes I like forget to clean them properly and I just replace them the next day. It's -okay. In fact, sometimes I don't like the expensive brushes because they stress me out. It's sort of like painting on really nice watercolor paper. If I have a crummy brush and I mess it up, I don't care. Honestly, I'm kind of thinking that with myself. I feel like I'm the first painting I do with them is going to be bad because my marks will be very timid and gentle, you know? Here's another question. Does the brand of the brush matter? Does that matter to you, Alex? Not at all. Um, I think that once you hit that, the price point we were talking about earlier of like, it's yeah, professional grade, it's good to work with. I have not met a brand that I've been like, oh, you're on the burn list. Nor have I actively seen like, oh, this brand is above and beyond the others. This is really worth investing in. Honestly, once they hit that same price point, I find pretty comparable. Yeah, I don't have any loyalty to any brands in terms of brushes. I pretty much just go to the art store. I feel up all the brushes. I'm like, I like these and that's it. It's actually a pretty simple process. And I'd like to hear from people in the chat. Do you care about brands? And if you do, what are some brands you like or dislike? So tell us in the chat. Really quick, we got a uh, super chat from Amaris Joseph. Uh, thank you so much for... <laughs> it's help like that that really keeps us going and keeps teaching going. Um, and 
transitioning right away, Ripples of Aqua said something great about the brushes where it's funny because a lot of brushes I have to have pristine, but I do keep a handful of crappy brushes just to get certain textures that can't be obtained by a soft brush. Yes, there is this brush right here that I've had since I was in college. And for some reason, when it gets wet, it makes a perfect like equal prongs in the middle. And I don't know why, and I can't recreate it. And it, so, yeah, I'll never get rid of this crappy brush. <laughs> all right. So let's break down for all of you some of the differences between the brushes. The first one is acrylic brushes. The best way to describe these is that they have a pretty specific shape, but they're fairly soft. A lot of them are made out of something like nylon. And so if you touch it with your finger, they feel very smooth. Would you say that's about accurate, Alex? Absolutely. And luckily, da -da -da -da. with them, they are smooth in that way, but still have that firmness to them, which is what helps it work with a thicker paint medium like acrylic or oil, what they're intended for. And by the way, what you're seeing on the right hand side here, we've listed the paint media that we think fits fine with these brushes. In the end, you can use whatever you want, but there are certain tools that I wouldn't recommend using oils with. Some are fine with acrylic. So if you guys revisit the slideshow later on, you can use that as a reference. Okay, now we have bristle brushes, which typically are used for oils, but you can totally use these with water mixable oils and also acrylics. And for me, the main difference is they're just a lot coarser. The acrylic brushes, they just feel very silky. These are more coarse, but they also feel like more powerful brushes. What about you, Alex? Yeah, uh, I I don't use them too much for like gouache specifically. They, although I could, the texture of them would be terrific. But yeah, I remember in oil painting with them, you feel like you can really get meaty and really knead into it with it. They're really terrific for that that particular use. The one thing I will say about the bristle brushes is you really have to clean them well. Because when I was in art school, Alex, I was so lazy and I never did it. And they died so fast. Yeah. <laughs> so take care of your brushes. There's other brushes like watercolor. It just does not matter. But I found with bristle brushes, you have to clean them. And yeah, and that's kind of adding on to that point of like, don't waste your money on the cheapest brushes. But take the time and invest in, even if the brush is like, oh, wow, a $15 brush. But if you take care of it, it'll last you a long, long time, regardless of the medium. I have brushes from 1998 that I was using in art school because I took care of them. So they don't have to be something that die after a year or two. You can really keep them around for a while. So Elise says, in general for watercolor, I like natural better than synthetic. Natural hair usually holds more water. I usually get Sumi brushes because they make a nice point. Do you mm. distinguish between natural and synthetic? Because honestly, Alex, I don't care. <laughs> honestly, no, it's a terrific point because I don't care for acrylic and oil brushes, but for watercolor, I, I would echo that point exactly. Uh, I really prefer natural brushes. They hold the water better. They tend to spread the pigment more evenly throughout the paper. It's it's That is that thing of, and I think that's it because I use watercolor brushes so much more seriously. With acrylic brushes, I'm like, anything will do. But with watercolor brushes, I'm like, oh, no, this is, yeah. <laughs> I, I've i gotten a lot more particular with them. Another thing to know about a lot of these brushes is there are very particular shapes. So this one is called a filbert, my personal favorite. And we also have ones, I think they're called flats, but sometimes they're called brights. Anyway, the ones that are shaped like rectangles. And there's also round brushes. I don't know what my deal is, Alex, but I hate these. I never use round brushes. Do you use these? See, that's the thing. I use round brushes. I could paint an entire gouache painting of mine using nothing but round brushes and not even <laughs> notice it. Yeah. However, I cannot do that with acrylic. I think because the round brush is so versatile with a flexible literally liquid medium like watercolor but the solid the solid nature of acrylic or oil it's like no you want a brush where that shape really can be important for how it's applied and i think the thing to bear in mind 
Alex and I aren't saying you have to use this brush for this because it's a really mm -hmm. personal situation with brushes. It's such a specific thing to each artist and what somebody likes is probably not what somebody else likes. So just take everything that he and I say with a grain of salt. Jacqueline Rivera says, I've had brushes since I was 10, bristle brushes. I'd started with oils, turning to acrylic, eventually watercolors after our kids were born. I'm 66 now, Rosemary and company picky with my brushes. That's brilliant. So you have multi-generational brushes. <laughs> my grandpa's oil painting set was like that. He had brushes there that he got when he was in his 20s that, yeah, he just kept, you take care of them and they last. All right, watercolor brushes. I'm such a weirdo, Alex. I hate these. They bother me because I don't like that there are so many shapes. Like, you know those packs that you can get where it's like 50? Like, I don't like yeah. them. I get overwhelmed. Do you Not like variety here. or do you like just a couple specific brushes? I think that's it. And now I don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here saying it's a scam because I know watercolor artists who use all of those different varieties of brushes and they need every single one. They're like a janitor with the key ring where they're like every key is useful. But for me, I only use round and flat brushes when I use watercolor. That That's it. Different sizes, but that's all that I find I need to use. Um, and with the textures that I'm going for, that works really well for me. So yeah, don't don't be intimidated by the watercolor brush se section. If you want to play around with it, trust me, flat and round is a really good intro of the brushes that you need to start with. Actually, that brings up a really good point, which is how many brushes are you using at a time? Because mm -hmm. when I paint with watercolor, I just use one Sumi brush, that's it. But when I paint with oils, I like to assign a color per brush. And so I end up holding like 12 in my hand. It is so specific to the media. It absolutely is. Yeah. Um, I've, <laughs> I loved painting alongside you and seeing you gradually like collect brushes like Wolverine, just holding all of them <laughs> together. Um, yeah. With watercolor, I actually have to remind myself I have more than one brush because I'll just be using a comfortable size four round and I'll just be, I can make it work, but I'm using it for things that that brush is not meant for. I'm like, oh, that's right. I have a size 10 brush for this exact purpose. Like <laughs> I, I'm the exact opposite. I could just use one brush for the whole thing. Sana is asking when you're starting out, is it trial and error when finding a brush or is there a specific brand anyone recommends getting? I think it's trial and error. I just go mm -hmm. to the store and I feel them up because I don't have any preference that's why i never buy brushes in the mail because i have to touch never. them i have to feel that interaction no is this really going to work for me honestly i think um princeton has been the brush that i've used the most often um also windsor newton brushes so i would i would recommend those two but honestly i would look more at that price point that they're being offered for and then if you find another brand grumbrocker um that they work just as well. I think pay attention to the grade. Um, you you don't want like low end, like, hey, like beginner student grade, because those are just brushes that aren't, uh, yeah, you, you get what you pay for with brushes. This is the liner brush, which honestly, I had never known anything about this brush until you and Lauren started singing its praises. And we actually recently did the stream with Jordan and Alex. And Alex, you used the liner brush almost throughout the entire stream with mm -hmm. India ink to do this beautiful line work. So what's so great about the liner brush? I was I was blown away because this stream was the first time I used it since uh, my undergrad. And it was wild. Um, I just hadn't picked it up and I was just happy with the brushes I had. But it's amazing how diverse of a line you can get with it, how smooth it can be. And it was just, it, it was phenomenal. It was absolutely phenomenal to use. Um, it worked really well with ink, but I've been playing around with it with watercolor and gouache as well. It doesn't work as well with gouache as it does with ink, I think because of that thickness. Um, but it's, oh, it's absolutely a joy. 
And it's great to see that Lauren's application of the Lottie brush is so different from yours. Your application is like very elegant, very clean lines. I know for Lauren, she used it almost like cupcake sprinkles to add these little textures and dots on top of her acrylic painting. So it's a very versatile brush. Mm -hmm. Just have to share a comedic comment from Seven Angelic. Uh, oh my God, I had one guy wanting to try a brush wouldn't it, which in our store, no problem, but he licked it and then we made him buy it. <laughs> I love it! <laughs> great! Because I, I was going to comment earlier when you're like, yeah, feel the brushes. And I'm like, yeah, honestly, every time I go to an art store, I'll like have my headphones in, I'll wave at the people that I recognize at the store, but then I'm just... That's just how it goes. So don't feel bad about doing that, but don't lick them. <laughs> you to want to do that. I don't understand what comprehension level you gain from licking a brush. That's bizarre. Well, actually, while we're on this topic, Moonbeam did answer that question here uh, in the comments. Uh, you, you do lick the brushes traditionally to get the hairs in place. Like, clean the brush first and then like lick it with saliva. That does kind of make a little protective coating around it. I cannot stress enough to clean the brush first. That's how Van Gogh got a little bit Wiggity wiggity. So yeah, clean the brush. Um, and then once it's fully dry, a little bit of saliva. If you don't want to put it in your mouth, put a little saliva on your fingertips to kind of protect the outer coating. Swear by it. So I really like these hockey brushes. They have many, many different sizes. This is an average size one. And they also have these, which are called pipe handle hockey brushes and actually i have two of them here so this is like the mama hockey brush they make <laughs> ones that are like half an inch that are a lot smaller and then this is the pipe handle one which i don't know why you'd ever need to make a stroke this gigantic <laughs> it's such a soft brush i mean i'm sure there's a reason but i've never used one of these before i like these when i'm trying to do an ink wash drawing and i'm just trying to wash in a big area of tone in the background. So these are really handy for that. And they're pretty delicate brushes. They're great for inks. I don't think I would really use them with acrylic because the hairs are so fine that I think you would have a lot of trouble cleaning acrylic out. So these really are better for liquid type of paints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, um, I mean, the same like thumbs up for if you guys want to like break the rules and use brushes for different mediums. Yes, you're probably going to get some great textures. I think like Clara just said, we're only going to let you know not to do it if it's like, yeah, it's going to be a one and done. Like the acrylic will ruin this brush. It might look cool. Try it out. But like, <laughs> it's probably not going to last more than one use. So the Sumi brush Typically, it's used for Chinese painting techniques, and a lot of people use India ink with it on rice paper, but I love it for watercolor. In fact, the Sumi brush for me, this was the reason why me and watercolor were now friends. We were not <laughs> friends for a long time. And I really think it's because the watercolor brushes felt so limiting to me. They didn't mm. feel flexible enough. And I just love that with a Sumi brush, you can get a stroke that's really tiny and you can make like a big blob and I just love the simplicity of it. So I think I'm a little bit of a weirdo here, but uh, I highly recommend it because it's great. Do you ever use these, Alex? No, but like, I couldn't help but smiling because it is, I mean, you, you, you're watercoloring like an oil painter. And it's cool that the Sumi brush helps you to do that. Um, whereas like I'm watercoloring like a traditional watercolorist. And it's a very cool thing of how the medium has these rules and it operates physically this way, but you just find the tool for it that makes it click with you. Here's another type of brush that's great. Lisa says, I use a high quality house painter brush to wet my paper, very satisfying. I mean, there's no brush that you cannot use. Anything <laughs> you think is gonna suit your needs is totally fine. Although this is a really cool invention, Alex. You know, when they mm -hmm. come out with the art supplies, it's so easy to be skeptical, but I'm in love with oh, these yeah. water brushes. Can you tell people why? They're a blast. I actually, these were the first watercolor brushes I ever used way back when in my freshman year, because um, I thought it was the coolest thing. You hold water in the handle of the brush 
And like by a slight squeezing of that, it incorporates water into the synthetic uh, bristles. It's, I used it for everything, um, but it's perfect for plain air painting. Like, oh, my Lanta, it's so good. Yeah, I mean, when I was traveling in China, I was using brush pen markers and I wanted to loosen them up a little bit with some water. And I just carried the water brush. It was great because when you're traveling and you're in the middle of a medicine market, like you don't really have a lot of space to paint. And it's just so nice to not have to carry a water dish. The water's already in the water brush and it's just so portable. So I recommend them highly. Yes. We're getting a uh, more logistic question from Crispy Paintbrush, great username. I've been wanting to buy a Sumi brush for a minute, but my local art store never carried them. Where would be a good place to buy one? Do well, you have a favorite the company brand? that sent us these hockey brushes, Yasutomo, they're excellent. They have all of these types of Sumi brushes and the hockey brushes and inks and stuff like that. I would check out their website. Okay, this is a super cheap brush. And most of these you have to get at a hardware store. They usually have them at the art supply stores, but I really like these for specifically gesso. Mm -hmm. Why are these so fun? They're, this is exactly it of like spend what, it, the, spend what the brush is worth. And for gesso, you are priming the canvas. That's all you're doing. It really doesn't matter how many bristles get stuck inside the gesso that then dry and then it, it's no big deal. Yeah, like I have just a rough handful of these cheapo $2 painters brushes for just this purpose. Yeah, and these come in all different sizes and I use them a lot for sculpture actually. If I'm using shellac or there's something else I need to apply, they're just so easy to use. And you can see us use them quite a bit in the stream where we talk about how to prepare painting surfaces. Like I use them for rabbit skin glue, they're just great brushes. I've never really used these, Alex, but they exist. Do you use these foam <laughs> brushes? <laughs> um, yeah, they just have way too much of an energy of like underfunded middle school art class to me. Um, I just don't, I never took them seriously. Um, obviously, the spongy texture, good for making textures and pieces. Um, actually, the last time I used them was in... Um, like glue application. I was like gluing a bound book and th they work really well for that. But that was, that was about it. However, if you guys swear by these, share the kind of work you've made. Yeah, especially in our Discord, hop in and be like, oh, this is me playing around with foam brush. My understanding about foam brushes is that they're really helpful when you want like a super even layer of paint. I can imagine with India ink that that would work out pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you again. Uh, Sauna18, thank you so much for the super sticker. And yeah, once again, board for you all. So it means the world to us. Thank you. And we do have a question here from Moonbean, who's asking a question about the China bristle brushes. Do they leave a nice texture in the gesso? You do get a little bit of texture from the China bristle brush. It's not that dramatic. And at least for me, I usually sand the gesso afterwards when it's dry. So I'm not that concerned about it, but mm. you'll get a little bit if that's something that you're thinking about. Whoa, whoa. How about, go ahead. Oh, really quickly, conversations merging together. WC Lee Art is saying, I only use foam brush to apply gesso to get a nice smooth surface. There you go. I can, I can absolutely see that. And that would avoid that texture of like the China bristle brush. All right, band brushes. These were the types of things I was like, ooh, this is such a fancy brush. And I never <laughs> used it until my colleague, Kathy Speranza showed me that she actually uses it with charcoal dust. And so you sprinkle the charcoal dust on and then you just swipe it and you get this perfectly even layer of tone. And then because she started doing that, I was just playing around with it with acrylics and it's actually a really cool brush. It's very delicate, has a super light touch 
and it's good with oils it's good with watercolor i've used it with everything like i'm such a fan now alex <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that. thank you for that i oh, honestly i always avoided them because i just saw them as almost like i don't need to spend that money on another brush that i'm going to use for like one purpose but i borrowed one from a friend like when we were painting together it was like oh that's cool like it can do things that no other brush can do that being said i'm not saying if you're like looking at buying like your first set of brushes i wouldn't say you need it but it's a very cool tool to have in your repertoire yeah this really sums up how i feel ariel says love a fan brush has more uses than you'd think i know because the shape is so specific you would imagine, oh, it probably just does one thing. It doesn't, it's extremely versatile. So I really recommend giving it a shot. I do use it in this abstract painting tutorial. So take a look at that, two mm -hmm. brushes. Why not? They're terrific. Um, I was first sold on toothbrush in, um, if you get some thicker gouache onto the toothbrush and you run your thumb along the bristles it makes a beautiful delicate little splatter spattering effect like such teeny teeny tiny points uh, a la like milky way galaxy kind of effect so yeah it's like a good toothbrush is honestly a really good tool to have well i think because the bristles are super stiff you really can like scrub your painting if you mm -hmm. want to do something a little bit more physically aggressive so they're really really fun okay let's talk palette knives again really personal decisions here nobody likes the same palette knife do you think that's true very much and i'm, I'm kind of jealous um because they seem like so much fun but that's they are hard to use on paper um you need a little bit of the give that canvas can give you because with paper palette knife will just poke right through but yes when i've been playing with palette knives for acrylic painting they are an absolute joy and actually, I do find, Alex, when I've taught painting one classes, that the palette knife is really hard for people who aren't used to it. It takes them a long time. And the biggest mistake that I see is people don't use enough physical pressure. They don't press down. They more just take the knife and scoot it side to side. But that's not very efficient. And so if for any of you who are just getting started, the palette knife feels weird and awkward, that's probably the reason it feels that way. Yeah, that was my first experience learning how to use it. It was like, beep, <laughs> like very nervous about applying it. But yeah, use it on either canvas or on um, a board, like gesso painted wooden boards. They're terrific for that. Now they make plastic ones and metal ones. Do you have a preference, Alex? Well, I personally like the metal ones because I was going to say the plastic ones keep breaking. But spookily enough, Ripple of Aqua just said the exact opposite. I love palette knives, but I've bought metal ones that I've broken and plastic ones that have lasted for years. <laughs> Which just go, it proves your exact point of it is all about that preference. <laughs> How about you? Do you prefer metal or plastic? Oh, I can't stand the plastic ones. Mostly because <laughs> they're just not as bouncy or as flexible, like they feel more mm -hmm. stiff. So when I put the physical pressure on the palette, I don't feel like I can move around quite so much. And for me, I know I would totally break the plastic ones. So the metal ones are definitely my preference. Now that said, the plastic ones are way cheaper. So it depends on your budget, but I would say if you can get a metal one and also they last forever. And once you have a palette knife, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, per that question, have you ever broken a metal palette knife? <laughs> no, not once. Okay, there are two different types of palette knives. One is an offset palette knife, which is the one you see on the right, has a little bit of a bend to it. And then there's one on the left, which has no bend, and that's a flat palette knife. Which one of these do you like, or is there certain use for either shape? Um, my bias is that the flat palette knife, the one that doesn't have that nice little hook towards the blade is really just an expensive butter knife that you can buy at an art supply store. Like I, I, there's, 
yeah, really calling it as I see it. The flat palette knife is just, I, I think it's not necessary. Well, I think the offset one, because it raises up your level from the actual knife, you can move around more. Like every time I'm using the flat palette knife, I feel like somebody's like pushing me up against the wall. Like I don't have any room to move around. Now that yeah. said, though, Lauren likes them. I mean, she uses them all the time for mixing <laughs> acrylic. So it depends on what you want to use them for. All right. Now, for a lot of people, the palette knife is used on a palette. It could be a paper palette like we have here or the glass palette I just showed you. But I love palette knife paintings. How about you, Alex? They are beautiful. And it's just once... As you were saying, once you get over the timid nature of painting with a palette knife, I uh, have yet to be impressed um, or yet to not be impressed by seeing them. Just their textures are so exciting and they're a really good way to paint without getting too focused on the details, honestly. It's a good way to start looking at shape and form and color in a kind of way that um, starts off seeming like a handicap, but is actually a very big benefit. Tell us in the chat, how many of you here have used the palette knife as a painting tool as opposed to just mixing? Because when I have taught introductory painting classes, this is always one of the first exercises because it gets people over the fear of the paint. It's such an awkward tool. Like you cannot do detail at all. And that's great because people start to see larger blocks of color and they mm -hmm. think about mixing. Because in an introductory painting class, people get so fixated on the brush and the palette knife ends up not really doing that much. So when you take the brush away and you really make people focus on just the knife, they make incredible progress with the mixing and application. So if anybody here has never done one before, give it a shot because they are so incredibly fun. And good for gesso and oil primer. A lot of people use this for applying surfaces to their paintings. And sometimes it's great for oil primer because oil primer is so thick. It's really hard to spread. You could do it with a brush, but I think it'd be really hard. So I always use just 100% palette knife for this. Mm. I'm curious because it, you use them a lot more than I do, especially with oil painting. There are some where it's like a tiny little diamond shape, some that kind of look like a big, almost like a shovel. like. Do you use as diverse a range of palette knives as you use for brushes? No, I just use the wide one. So the one that I was showing you earlier, this one, I use for oil primer. I don't like the tiny one. The little diamond one just drives me crazy. But I guess my favorite one, actually, I have it here. <laughs> it's sitting on my desk. This is my favorite shape. I like it to be a little bit long but not too wide. It's still pretty bouncy. This, this is the shape that I've just stuck with my whole life. I see life. it has like a rounded point. It doesn't have like a needle point at the tip. Yeah, mm -hmm. like what's the, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I would just poke a hole in my canvas with that one. I, I, would, I would accidentally do that. Absolutely. All right, tools for scraping. Why might you want to scrape at your painting, Alex? Why not? <laughs> I think that honestly, I for whether it's in drawing or in painting or sculpture, like the act of removing something you've applied is such not only cathartic, but a way to bring out new textures, new depth and new space in the painting. Uh, with these tools, uh, I will say these don't work for me with watercolor and gouache because they're on paper and any of these tools would just tear right through. For watercolor and gouache, I, it, you just use water and then different forms of texture, like a rag or a paper towel. But these are all terrific for really just peeling and scraping away acrylic or oil and just getting some cool um, removal in there to get those textures fired up. And it doesn't even have to just be removing. I find just a plain plastic scraper or even just a piece of cardboard you can get really cool effects. I mean, sometimes it looks really smooth like a squeegee, but other times you can do something a little bit more percussive or something that looks a little bit more brittle. And so I think sometimes there's just so much emphasis on brushes in painting that people oftentimes don't step outside of that. Have you seen that, Alex? 
Yeah, I think it's it kind of what you were talking about at the very beginning of like, yeah, we start with brushes because of course you're painting with brushes. That makes sense. But you have to kind of get yourself out of that mindset of like, oh, painting must be the application of paint with a brush onto a surface. Could be the removal of paint. You don't have to use a brush and really kind of trying new things. And similar to me and using a liner brush for the first time in 10 years and being completely blown away. Like once you get comfortable with your technique, that's maybe a time to spice it up and see how to grow further. Anna says, I think scraping is an essential part of the painting process, particularly when you've overworked a painting, you need to get some freshness back. That's great. I love that idea because sometimes you do feel like you just murdered your painting and what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, literally, All right. it's always been better when I just scrape it and go over again, always. Now, other than scraping, anything goes like if you look at a piece of yarn you're like hey maybe i should paint with that do it. it it's like there's no rules here as far as where you can go i mean i do a lot of printmaking and for me you could totally take the brayer probably with acrylic and just roll it on the surface of the canvas there's things like syringes if you put acrylic into a plastic syringe you can pipe your painting like lauren have you ever done 3D stuff like this, Alex? I have dabbled a little bit with it. I've actually used another material we'll recommend the um, with the um, pastry bags. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very satisfying. So I actually demoed these disposable pastry bags in one of our recent streams. And oh boy, was that fun and satisfying. I'm sure there's a baker out there who's just rolling their eyes at me but it's great if you want to build up actual 3d forms on the surface of your painting which a lot of people do and i'll also say in the interest of uh saving money you don't need to get pastry bags uh you could just get like uh ziploc baggies and just cut the tip of one of the corners off i use that for baking and painting I like this from W315, Plaster's mm. Trowel. Ooh, like I bet that's power really power. powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Things like Q-tips. I mean, basically, if you just raid your bathroom, <laughs> there's like so much waiting for you in there. You've got the old toothbrushes, the Q-tips. It's awesome. Yeah, my mom found a painting at like a little art market and she was like, it's lovely and it's a beautiful landscape painting. And the background in the sky, the texture is paper towel texture, that quilted pattern. Um, and it's like, mom, that's a paper towel they used to make that. And she loves it still. I mean, it's ingenious. It looks really good for the painting. I want to give a shout out to Anna, who says, painting is my life. I use all the tools. Thank you so much for your support, Anna. All right. Let's talk about Alex's little secret which mm -hmm. is a plastic dropper. And what do you use these for, Alex? I love it. Uh, it's one of those tools where I use it for such particular uses, but I couldn't go without it. Mostly for being accurate with mixing ink and water so that I get my gradients right. Because of course, if it runs out, I'm like, oh, how do I do that one again? Uh, so you can very accurately measure that. Also, it's fun to do before it dries your initial wash of the background in watercolor and then just soaking up with the dropper and doing a couple drops and letting it just pool um i don't use that trick too often but it's a very cool way to kind of spice up the background painting and alex actually demonstrates his technique for mixing indie ink gradients in this tutorial so if you want to see that you can take a look and now we have some cleanup tools that are necessary but also really fun like when i discovered the tuber i was like whoa <laughs> it's so these? cool mm. i i don't use them too often because the watercolor the little tubes are so tiny but they're sweet i love these they're so satisfying if you've never used these before it's basically so you can squeeze every last drop of oil paint out of your tube and it's 
great because a lot of these paints are not cheap. I mean, when you're yeah. paying $25 for a little tube of oil paint, you're going to want to milk every last bit of it. These so are I recommend great. using these. These are great for toothpaste too. Absolutely terrific. What, you used yours on toothpaste? I tried it once when I was in school and it worked really well. <laughs> really? I need to use mine for toothpaste. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cotton rag. To be honest, Alex, out of all the tools we've talked about, this is my favorite one. Cotton rags, is there anything they can't do? I mean, the first most obvious use is to clean your brushes, but I love painting with rags. They're so fun. Honestly, I, I would agree. This is just the one that I cannot do without. Me, I just have paper towels just handy all over my studio just for use, either an application or removal of watercolor. It's incredible. And you can obviously just cut up old t-shirts. You can buy them at Home Depot. But I actually discovered these, Alex, these blue shop towels that they sell at hardware stores. It's yes. sort of like if your paper towel and my cotton rag had a baby. It's sort of in between. <laughs> I find look, look, them very handy. <laughs> those are like the fancy paper towels where I like get mad at if, if anyone uses them for like normal paper towel uses. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> So rags are good if you want to just push the paint around. They're also great if you're working more reductively. I use them so much when I'm in the beginning of a painting and I'm like, oh, I don't like that. Wipe it out. I don't like that. Wipe it out. And they're just incredibly versatile. So get them if you're not using them. We also have window scrapers. These also, you pretty much have to buy them at a hardware store. And typically they are used for cleaning a glass palette because you put an actual razor blade in there, it's very sharp. I would not recommend doing that on your painting, but they're amazing. I mean, I don't know why nobody told me about this until I had been painting for like five years. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of those things where if you make the glass palette, you need to have one of these because otherwise, like this is what makes the glass palette so valuable is that you can just scrape off the paint and continuously reuse it time and time again. The only thing is you really have to clean it well, because if you don't do that, the razor blade gets stuck and then you can't get it out and it's very sad. So I highly recommend doing a good job. Elisate says, how often do you change the razor on the window scraper? I feel like mine stopped scraping as well after just a couple sessions. Very satisfying to use. I don't change mine that often, but I suspect some of it has to do with how thick your paint is. Probably if your paint is really thick on the palette, it's going to take a little bit more physical abuse. So I think I would definitely think about, um, I don't know, you could probably spread your paint a little bit more so it's not so thick. That might be a good way to do it. So we do have parts one and parts two of this curriculum available. And remember, we have a page on rprof.org that is all of our curriculums. We've got illustration, business, animation, and comics. And they're just a great way to do your one-stop shopping at ArtProf. So you're not having to go to 18 different websites. We also have these Google Docs, which get more specific and link to a lot of other resources that are particular to the painting curriculum. And also, this Google Slideshow is available. The link is in the YouTube video description below. And we also have a page on artprof.org that is all of our slideshows. They're really handy. Sometimes you just don't want to watch the whole video. And so you just go through the slides and can do a nice, quick review. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Alex and I will be hanging out in the Artprof Discord. So please chat with us about window scrapers and the satisfying quality that they put on you. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, leave us a comment. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for giving us what we need to keep our content 100% free and accessible to everybody. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. We'll see you next time. Bye.